All attendees are in listen-only mode. Greetings, and welcome to this joint DCMI ACES webinar on digital preservation metadata and improvements to premise in version 3.0. It's my pleasure uh, today to introduce both the joint webinar series and today's presenter, Dr. Angela Dapper. The DCMI ACES webinars are provided as a service to the members of both organizations and to guests. The series focuses on best practices in innovation design and deployment of metadata and metadata related systems. Today's presenter, Dr. Angela Dapir is Senior Research Fellow at the University of Portsmouth in the UK. She serves on the Premise Editorial Committee and the Digital Preservation Program Board of the National Records Scotland. You'll have an opportunity to ask Angela questions at the end of the webinar. We ask that you wait to enter your questions uh, into the provided data entry box until Angela has nearly completed uh, her presentation. We'll try and answer as many of the questions as possible in the available time. With that, I turn the podium over to you, Angela. Thank you, uh, and welcome to my presentation. Uh, I have a lot, ma lot of material to cover. Uh, we are, let me just see why this is not working. Ah, there we go. Um, so this presentation is uh, divided into three sections. I will start by an introduction to what digital preservation metadata is and why we need it. Then the second section is about the premise de facto standard and how we use it. The third section is about improvements we're introducing to the upcoming version three of the standard. So let's get started with what digital preservation metadata is. Um, digital preservation metadata is metadata that is um, there to ensure long-term accessibility of digital resources. So that means unlike traditional metadata, we have to focus a lot more on digital idiosyncrasies. And uh, long-term accessibility, uh, we have uh, a, a unique situation where we have to think ahead about what metadata might be needed in the future. Normally metadata is specified in order to uh, support functions and needs that we have right now, but for digital preservation metadata we have to uh, uh, make a few more guesses about what might be needed and what uses might we find in the future. Um, sorry. I'm having problems forwarding my, well, we'll see how this goes. So digital objects must be self-descriptive in some way. If you have just uh, digital objects by, the, by themselves as bit sequences, um, they uh, don't make sense. If I open a book and I find it, I can find enough information to see what it's about with a digital object. That's not necessarily the case. So we need to associate metadata with it that enables us to describe, manage, and discover the digital object independently from the systems that were used to create them. And uh, as you all know, XML is frequently used as a a language to uh, capture this metadata because it's machine and human readable, but uh, premise does not depend on XML. It is just one um, popular way of describing digital preservation metadata. Um, in order to decide what preservation metadata we need, we need to know what the preservation goals are. And I like to use the pyramid that uh, Priscilla Kaplan published at some point uh, that basically says all digital preservation is based on the fact that the digital objects must be available available to us. If they're not in our control, then we can um, also not preserve them. In addition to it, we need to ensure uh, identification, so we need persistent unique identifiers that don't break, that don't duplicate, that are reliable over the long term. We need to ensure understandability of the digital objects uh, by using documentation. We need to ensure fixity, that means 
the digital object isn't broken. Uh, providing secure storage is one aspect of it. Um, we need to ensure variety, so we need to be able to access them via yeah, the data carriers, but we also need to understand the full uh, Plat software hardware platform and the rendering stack so we can actually uh, access and, and use uh, digital objects. Then we must ensure renderability that is uh, mostly about managing the file formats that we need and uh, we want to ensure authenticity so that the users of our digital objects can rest assured that what they're seeing is what the the digital object is purporting to be. So what metadata do we need in order to support these goals? That's the question. And um, our domain is as follows. We have born digital items that are delivered on a variety of different platforms. And we have digitized items that can be print or it could, could be um, video materials, other materials that are in some form digitized and then become digital. So why do they need different metadata for the long-term preservation than traditional materials well? So um, one reason is technology dependence. If I have a book, uh, as long as I um, know the language and, and can read it in some way, I can make sense of it right away. Uh, digital material With digital materials, I don't have direct access. So uh, to start with, I have a set of files that are not necessarily self-descriptive. They may have complex formats. Uh, file names might not be meaningful. Uh, file extensions might not be correct. Um, and then in order to access these files, there's um, a te technological barrier, basically. I depend on uh, data carriers. I depend on uh, um, the media hardware. I depend on peripherals and processors and input and output devices and so on before I finally can go and access this book for example, in this example. And so I need metadata that helps me uh, describe this whole technological stack so that I can recreate it in the future and still access the, the object. So the first form of metadata that we need is format information and then rendering information about software and hardware, but also about any other technical dependencies. For example, if I have a, a XML files, then I might need schemas, I might need style sheets, I might need character encoding and so, so technological metadata. Then um, I need structural metadata because digital objects are uh, much more granular than traditional objects. They're broken down into many little pieces. So to understand physical relationships, for example, I might have an HTML file that has a GIF and a JPEG embedded in it, so I want to know about embedded files. I might have um, many files that need to be read in sequence, so I need to know the root file and the, the sequence of files. Um, I need to understand logical structural relationships that are not obvious from just a set of, of computer files, so I might want to know where is the title page, where is the table of contents, which is the first page and the subsequent ones. I might want to know which chapters are in, in which um, computer files. So this is structural information, physical and logical. Then I need to be aware of the uses that I uh, expect for the material. So here's an example going from a, a a, a manuscript to a digitized version turning the pages. Um, so this is going from the past to now. We already need additional metadata to help us understand it. I might need a translation from Latin to English, or I might need a, a sound recording that would explain to me what the musical notation on this page might have sounded like. Uh, but also for going from today to tomorrow, if we preserve, for example, databases. It's not enough to just have all the technical knowledge and the definitions of the table structures and the, the, um, the, uh, the different 
definitions, data definitions, and so on. But I need to explain to uh, future users how they can use this information. So I might have, as shown at the bottom here, an example query that might be typical for the database, or I might uh, show the user how to join two different tables together via the the customer ID and the customer table in the order has a customer ID as well. So I need to explicitly state the possible use of this material for future users. Um, and furthermore, we want descriptions of the context in which this digital object belongs. Uh, that means I want to uh, specify what the original source was, especially if it was digitized, for example. I might have want, want additional information, for example, if I look at a page that is digitized, was that the right-hand side or the left-hand side of the original document that matters to some people? And I might want to uh, relate to other digital items for example, if I migrate from one file format to another format, I want to document uh, what the ori original digital copy was for this material, so context description. Um, and then there are two major risks that are particularly severe for digital objects that are not uh, found in a stronger measure in traditional materials and those two risks are obsolescence and mutability and I will address both of those in, in turn now. So with obsolescence we basically mean that um, in this whole rendering stack that I have, parts may become obsolete, not usable anymore. So for example, my data carriers may become uh, decayed or not uh, supported by the hardware anymore. So I might have to do bit migration either to a new data carrier or to a new data carrier technology. I might need to do content migration from a file format that's obsolete to a new file format, or I might have to replace parts of the rendering stack that are not supported anymore with new ones. And the extreme case of that is I might have to emulate the whole platform. Um, and all of these things are preemptive preservation actions that have the nature of a transformation. I can also do for forensic transformations. In that case, I've already lost access to a digital object and I can uh, investigate it and see whether I can reconstruct parts of it. But uh, any of these uh, ways of dealing with obsolescence means that I, I have a transform where I end up with a digital object that is not equivalent to the original ones. And so there are certain risks involved with it that need to be mitigated through metadata. So for example, I want to avoid rights violation while I perform a transformation, and therefore I need rights, info, rights metadata, rights information that tells me which preservation actions are permissible. Um, I want to prove authenticity to the user, so if they get a new transformed file, I want to show um, how, how authentic it is. Uh, so I need to record the history of all the actions that I've performed on the resource, and I want to have a history of custodianship. So specifically this means that I need to record events dates, changes that happened, decisions that have been made, and agents that were involved in it. So uh, decision makers, uh, responsible parties, but also software and hardware tools used. Um, if I don't manage to create a completely 100% authentic copy of the original, then I need to manage potential loss of object characteristics and uh, a form of metadata that's called significant characteristic let's uh, you specify which uh, characteristics of the digital objects are essential to be preserved in the preservation action. So um, if, for example, I have a Word file, there's an edit history that tells me who has made what changes when, and if I would migrate this Word file into PDF, I would lose the edit history. So it would be important to know whether this is a significant characteristic for the intended user, um, and then perform limit my preservation actions to preservation actions that uh, preserve the significant characteristics. Um, I need to demonstrate the degree of uh, authenticity by recording if any characteristics have been lost in a transformation. Um, I need to explain the decisions that have been made by um, 
knowing the business rules, especially policy and strategy that guided the preservation actions. So the, these are all sorts of documentation that are needed in or, and in a form documentation is a, a form of metadata uh, to uh, mitigate obsolescence risks. And this, then the second big risk uh, for digital items that I've mentioned is mutability. And that means that somebody can intentionally change the content of an item and can easily do that. Or they can accidentally change something, for example, when they copy f a file from one place to another. And then in addition to this, we can have uh, decay, just bit rot, or bits flip, and that can even small changes can result in potential complete loss of the access to the digital object. So again, we need metadata to mitigate that risk. Um, to ensure the viability that the object is readable, we need to um, have metadata on the data carriers used, the type of the medium, its preservation characteristics, the age of the medium, when it was recorded, and usage patterns, because different media decay at a different rate depending on how many read or write actions you have. Um, fixity means that the object is unchanged and what one usually does is one records uh, checksum metadata that's often also called message digests and hash functions and they're, they're very similar things. Uh, what I do is I take the digital object as a bit sequence and I run an algorithm on it that calculates from this bit sequence number, which is the checksum. And if I repeat this activity every few months, then I should always have the same checksum from the calculation. And if it doesn't result, then that's an indication that the file or the digital object has been damaged in some way, and then I can retrieve a backed up copy, for example. And metadata to support this would be knowing the algorithm that created the checksum, date and time information, and the originator of the checksum. Um, I need to ensure integrity that the object is whole and unimpaired, and for that I can uh, run um, characterization tools over the digital objects that identify the file format and validate that the file is a, a correct implementation of the file format definition. It can also identify whether the file is as damaged or defective in some ways. And um, if I have a digital object that consists of several different files, then I would like to have structural metadata that allows me to check that all the files are there that I'm expecting to have. And then finally, uh, one can use additional metadata like digital signatures and access rights information in order to make sure that the uh, authenticity of the object is protected and that it is what it purports to be. So this was um, sort of a whirlwind introduction into why uh, we need new forms of digital uh, of metadata for digital preservation. And I'm now going to go on to uh, the premise standard. So what is it? What is its data model and how do we use it? So premise is the international de facto standard for metadata to support the preservation of digital objects and to ensure their long-term usability. Um, it defines the core metadata that you need for digital uh, it is about 10 years old now. It was developed by an international team of experts. It's implemented in digital preservation projects around the world, and it is incorporated into commercial and open source digital preservation tools and systems. Um, the resources that are available to you can be found at the Library of Congress uh, website. Uh, it is not a Library of Congress product. It is truly an international and community carried standard, but the Library of Congress makes uh, the resources kindly available to host the material. So the key document is the data dictionary that is currently in version 2.2, and we will we hope to release an, a major re release version 3 this summer in July, hopefully. And um, additionally, you can find an XML schema and an OWL ontology for it. Uh, the XML schema is one version higher than the data dictionary because there's a, a minor cha change that I will uh, talk 
to you about later. And uh, the data dealer is completely implementation independent, so you can implement it using any technology. The XML schema and the owl ontology are simply there as a community service because it allows people to get a quick start on an implementation and reuse um, those implementation options if they want to. And in addition, you can find a supporting documentation at the website. Um, the premise editorial committee is the body that is uh, responsible for coordinating revisions and the implementation of the standard. Uh, we run tutorials, we um, have ev events, we um, run the premise implementation fair which is the mostly annual user group meeting that is often associated with the IPRIS conference and uh, users meet present uh, what they have done with premise, they discuss uh, improvements, possible improvements, they answer each other's questions, support each other, and the editorial committee uh, reports on the activity for the previous year. Um, and it's free, open to anybody, and I assume free in most cases, sorry. <laughs> and um, then there's also an online forum that's called the Pick List, which is the Premise Implementers Group, where you can subscribe at the Library of Congress website and um, ask questions about uh, implementation issues you might have. So, what is the Premise Data Dictionary? It is mostly a common data model that helps people organize their thinking about preservation metadata. It is also intended to be a standard for exchanging information packages between repositories. So uh, the data dictionary tells which metadata elements are mandatory, for example, but that doesn't mean that internally in a repository they always have to be um, recorded in exactly that way, but what a compliance system must do, it must be able to produce this information when it exports and exchanges information between repositories. The premise data dictionary is implementable, uh, but it is technically neutral, so it's specified to be machine implementable, but you can choose any technology to implement it with, and it provides core metadata, that means it, pro it is a list of metadata elements that uh, you can check against to see whether um, you have captured most metadata elements that you have to be to expect to be important for digital preservation purposes. But what premise is not? It is not an out of the box solution. In order to um, apply it, you have to um, model your environment and decide on the exact use of the metadata elements. Um, it is not all needed metadata, so Premise tries to not overlap, for example, with descriptive metadata or with administrative metadata and so on. They're supposed to be complementary to each other. And also, it cannot cover all the content type specific metadata. So, if, for example, I have um, TIFF images in my collection, then I might want to have uh, technical metadata that's specific to images and not to documents or to audiovisual materials, for example. And so I can extend the premise information at defined extension points in order to have external metadata schemas with a higher granularity detail on a specific type of, of metadata. <coughs> Premise originally also was supposed to be just for OIRS, and that means it neglected to some degree uh, things that had happened outside the repository. And we have worked hard at integrating and smoothing out the information and not make a distinction anymore between um, events that might have happened before or objects that are outside of the repository. So it's, it is becoming more a lifecycle management uh, standard than it was in the past. Also, it never was intended to be a rights management standard, but it has developed um, so strongly in uh, specifying information about copyrights, licenses, statutory requirements, and so on, that uh, actually it isn't just used for specifying 
preservation action rights anymore, but a lot of people now also use it in order to specify their access rights or, or rights in general. So this is a growing part of premise, I would say. Um, so what's the data model? Um, the core th bits of a data model are the entities, the things that we need to describe and that we have to collect metadata for. And the entities in the premise data model are objects, intellectual entities, rights, events, and agents. And the, the core entity is the object. Uh, the object has three different categories. It is either representation or a file or a bit stream. So everybody knows what a file is. A computer file is um, has a file name, it has a certain file format, and it's managed by a file system. And a bitstream is just a, a part of a file, and it could be, for example, if I have an uh, audiovisual digital object that I might just want to access a part of an audio track for a certain snippet of a speech. Uh, so bitstreams are contained in files and then files are contained in representations. A representation is defined to be a set of files that are needed to work together in order to get one rendition or one use of the digital object. So for example, I might have to have an HTML file and a style sheet to get a proper rendition of a page. And um, so the objects have a relationship to the other entities. Um, they link to the intellectual entity, which is basically the descriptive metadata that, ma that um, is managed together as one unit. Objects link to write statements and to events. And then events link to the agents that were used when the event was performed. And agents are also can also serve as rights holders in rights statements. So this is the basic data model. And that's what needs to be applied in your implementation. And then for each entity, we have a uh, the properties or the metadata elements in premise that's called semantic units. So semantic unit is basically a property or a metadata element. And as an example, I have picked the entity object and I have shown you some categories of metadata elements um, that apply to objects. So there's information about identification, there's a technical information in object characteristics, there may be storage information, uh, signature information, and so on. And these are just categories. They are hierarchically structured. Uh, so this has semantic unit containers rather than semantic units. And um, they are hierarchically structured until you put them out in a leaf node that is then a semantic unit that can take a value. So if I take a look further down, for example, for 1.5 object characteristic, then I see that there's information about the digital object's composition, its fixity, its size, its format, the creating application, passwords, and, and encryptions, for example, and they can go further down. So in addition to the semantic units that describe the entity, we also have relationships that describe how this entity relates to others. So in, in the case of object, there are relationships that link one object to another one. Um, and we have links to events and rights. And if I look at the leaf semantic units that finally can take the value, or any semantic unit container or semantic unit really has a table in the data dictionary that explains how it is to be used. So the example here is size. Um, it tells us whether this is a container or whether it can take values. It tells us addition. So here it says, for example, the unit of the size is in um, the rationale explains why it is good to use for digital preservation and in what cases to use it. It gives the data constraint. It must be an, an integer. It says when it is applicable. So size is applicable to files and bit streams, but not to representation categories. There are examples. It uh, specifies if it's repeatable or obligatory. And then there are notes about usage and creation. So 
this was an overview of what you can find, what premise is and what you can find in the data model. And I wanted to give you an example of how to use premise, how to apply it for your specific implementation. So first of all, when we're choosing the metadata elements or the semantic units that apply, this is a dynamic process because our understanding of digital preservation metadata still is evolving and that's uh, partially because we, our uh, understanding increases, but it's also partially because um, the technical framework changes and the legal framework changes, and so one has to adapt uh, the standard over time to these changes. Some metadata may no longer be necessary and some new metadata may become necessary to support digital preservation. In addition, we need to tailor premise to the varying needs of the users. So one reason that we have different content types, say I have an image, in that case I'd have, for example, I could have one object that just is on a file level and I describe the technical properties of the image, that's one possibility. If I uh, have on the other hand uh, electron journals, for example, then one might want to describe the type the journal title and um, the issues that uh, are delivered for the title and then the articles contained in each issue. So we have a, already a, a different structure and three different object entities that we might want to describe in this. So you see how the content type affects how we end up implementing the premise data model. Um, then also we have institutional policies that vary, that result in different choices of, of entities and uh, semantic units and uh, the in intended use of the metadata also makes a difference. So how do I get from this data model to an implementation? I have just simply chosen the presentation that I'm giving you now. Uh, I have created an intellectual entity for this presentation that's on the top that basically is just descriptive metadata and then I've created a first representation for it which really means I have created a PowerPoint file. So this representation consists of only one file in the special case. In other formats I'm have several files and there's a, a relationship between the representation object and the file object that is of type structural and of subtype include. So premise has a variety of relationship types between objects. And then in order to deposit um, my presentation with DCMI, I have to create a PDF. So I need a second representation, that's the PDF file. Um, and there's a relationship between the, the first and the second representation, which has the type derivation, so it's not structural, but it's a direct derivation, and the subtype has source. So that tells us, uh, that gives us provenance information for the second representation to see where it came from. And then in addition to it, I might have written some, some speaker notes. So there's a third representation of this intellectual entity, uh, but it's not a direct derivation from um, the first two representations it might have a structural sibling relationship. So these might be the things I want to capture for all my presentations in my collection, an intellectual entity level, several representations, several files for each representation, and um, has source and has sibling relationships. And then I decide that in my profile, I also for every derivation relationship to record what event was used to do this derivation or migration here. and what event type it is, uh, what agent was used to do it, so I know what software was used to create this, this derivation. So here you go, you have a first uh, profile that shows how the, the um, data model from premise is applied to this situation. And uh, I'm going down a, deep, a bit deeper, what does that mean if I look at individual semantic units? So for every entity that I create an instance for, I have an identifier. So object identifiers always consist of an identifier type and value. So in, in this example, I've chosen arcs and then some unique persistent identifier for each individual entity instance. On the top, I have my intellectual entity and then below are two 
representations, the PowerPoint and the PDF, and a relationship between them. Uh, for every relationship, I specify the relationship type. And then I can, uh, this relationship is associated with this version here. That's indicated by the arrow. So version uh, 2 uh, specifies that it is related in a has source relationship with the object that has the identifier version 1, which is the same thing that you can find here in this in this representation. And then I said I also want to link to the event that created this derivation, so that information would be stored in the same relationship container. And I would say the event here that is specified to have a, a local repository identifier 2.2, um, this is uh, in this um, representation so I know, so I can find the, the event that has created the derivation and I, I see that this is of type migration and there may other, be other information like event outcomes, event dates and so on. And it, the last requirement I had is I wanted to um, also store the agent that was used, the software agent. So that means then in the event I want to have a linking agent identifier and that again uses the identification of the agent to link those two entity instances together and here we have the information about what software was used in order to create this migration. So I hope this gives you an idea of the flavor uh, of how premise is used and how the data model is applied. Um, with respect to the topic of tailor solutions, I wanted to mention one last thing. It might be a bit intimidating to see how much thought has to go into uh, creating a profile. Um, how much you need to know and how much thought you need to put into it depends on how individual your situation is. So there are off-the-shelf um, software tools, both open source and commercial, and they have um, standard predefined metadata profiles for the typical occasion. So for example, for ebooks or for images. And if you have a standard application, then you can possibly use um, existing systems pretty much out of the box and you don't really have to know all that much about the premise that's underlying it implemented in the software and the only way you interface with it is by f maybe filling in data at a user interface and uh, inspecting the, the overall metadata. But the more you have to configure or extend or adapt or even custom build a system, the more you have to understand um, what premise really means and give it thought about how to tailor it to your situation. So now I um, would like to go on to the third part of the presentation which is talking about the changes that are coming up in version 3. So um, it's the next major version. By major version mean, I mean that we are actually changing the data model that I've just presented to you. It, hopefully released in July and we are now in the proofreading and copy editing phase. Um, premise is being improved all the time based on user needs through communication over the online forum and with user groups or with direct requests to the editorial committee and so I have listed here the the main changes that are coming up in version 3. So I wanted to start with four minor changes uh, and just give you an illustration of what sorts of things change from version to version. Uh, preservation level is a way for people to specify what commitment the organization makes to preserving this object. So depending on the, the so, so to speak the value of the, the object one might more or less effort or commitment to it. So uh, at this point one could only specify a preservation level. There was a request that people wanted to specify preservation levels for different activities at, on a smaller granularity so we introduced a preservation level type so we can say for bit preservation we make this commitment, for logical preservation we uh, this level of commitment and so on. 
Uh, the second point is agents, for example, if an agent is a software agent at the moment, we can just specify an agent name. People said they also want to uh, specify an agent version, so we've made that possible. The third example is known values. There's a number of semantic units that either had a value or didn't have a value. And the users have said they want to be able to specifically say if a, a value is unknown. So for example, I might have run uh, characterization tools over a file in order to figure out what the file format is but the characterization tool didn't succeed. Then I want to still record that I have already run this characterization and that it is unknown. So that's one example. And then the fourth example is event detail information. I've illustrated this here in the, in the slide deck. So if I describe an event, I have information like the identifier, the type, the date and time of the event, detail, uh, then outcome information, and then links to the agent and the objects that are um, affected by this event. And what people said, we want to have a lot more granularity and we want to be able to use structured metadata to specify the event detail. So what we have done is we have uh, created a container that's called event detail information and now you can still specify event detail as you would have done before but there's an extension point where you have an external um, structured metadata extension where you can specify what detail of an event is specific in this specific situation. So those were just some examples of the minor changes we had. I also wanted to show you um, the difficulty of defining an implementation um, independent data dictionary. So one request we got is uh, a lot of the semantic units in uh, premise have um, a recommendation that the user should use a controlled vocabulary. And that means they can either use a controlled vocabulary that is supported by premise or they can define their own local vocabulary but it must be defined and it must be associated with the premise um, profile and so it is obvious that people want to specify what the authority is where this vocabulary comes from so in this example if you read from the top down we have an event identifier then we specify the event type and say it's a validation event and event type is one of those semantic units that should have controlled vocabulary so where does this word validation come from so there is the the premise vocabulary that can be found online and validation is one of us taken off this list and so what we have we had a choice we have 61 semantic um, units that have controlled vocabularies one could have uh, created a, a structure similar to what you see here at the event identifiers where basically we have a, val a type and a value so here one could also say one has an authority and a value but that would have meant creating containers for 61 metadata as semantic units that at the moment don't have containers. So we decided to restrict this to um, an implementation specific solution but advise our users that they can find their own solution if they're not using XML for example. So in XML we have added the three attributes that allow you to either specify an authority name the pre premise event type or a, a URI that links to it and um, you can use the value URI or the, the actual value, the validation word in order to specify authority. So in this case we've chosen an implementation dependent solution and advi simply advise the, the implementer of uh, premise that they can find implementation specific solutions. So now finally I'm getting to the, the major changes in version 3. There are three of them. That is, um, they affect intellectual entities, environments, and physical objects. And I'll, I'll talk about them uh, in turn. So let's start with intellectual entities. 
intellectual entities you see up here that dangling off to the side. They are a set of content that is considered a single intellectual unit for purposes of management and description. So examples would be a book, a map, a photograph and so on. Uh, basically what that means is this is descriptive metadata. That's what, what intellectual entities mostly are about and premise does not want to duplicate any efforts of defining descriptive metadata. So in version 2 we said that it is assumed that uh, premise metadata is held inside a, a metadata container, for example METS, and that in that container is also descriptive metadata that is, you, uh, that is defined using a descriptive metadata standard. And then we can from the premise object to this description. So premise has not defined any semantic units on the level of intellectual entity with the only exception of being able to link via an identifier to it. And um, it turns out that that limited our use of intellectual entities uh, in several ways which I'll explain now and we decided to change the data model like this. We take away the intellectual entity altogether and instead of having three object categories, representation, file and bitstream, we now have four. Intellectual entity has become a, an object category um, together with the other three and uh, it can adopt the semantic units that representation has. It turns out they're identical. And uh, having this new structure where intellectual entities are integrated into the, the inner premise data model has the advantages that, for example, we can now relate the intellectual entity to rights and events. We can make use of the fact that objects can relate to other objects, so we can support structural and derivative relationships with objects. Um, we can use intellectual entities in order to uh, represent aggregates such as a collection or we can uh, say we have um Use, we want to implement Ferber so we have an intellectual entity on the work level and another one on the expression level and we can relate them to each other. Um, we can capture versioning information so if an intellectual entity is versioned over time then we can uh, capture this with this relationship. Um, we can capture metadata updates through the relationship and we can associate business rules with intellectual entities. So intellectual entities now can have significant characteristics, they can have risk definitions, guidelines for preservation actions and so on. We're still staying out of the business of describing intellectual entity. For that we're still linking to outside descriptions but we have embedded intellectual entities more tightly into the whole concept. Now I'm going on to environments. Uh, with environments I mean um, computing environments such as operating systems, application software, hardware or computing resources and um, we have devised a high-level data model that supports environments more fully than a premise version 2 has. We, we are still not doing any detailed characteristics that are specific to an environment type so we're certainly not for example, defining metadata that would tell you all the technical characteristics of a, of a certain chip design that is out of the scope. We're just at a high, high data level and we want to um, capture things like um, environment aggregates and networks. So in this example I have a content file at the bottom and this content file requires a certain software application which in turn requires a certain software library and both of them run on a certain operating system which requires a certain hardware architecture and in addition we need hardware peripherals which need software drives and so on and so we have this network of um, that specify this rendering or execution stack or platform that is needed so that we have long-term access to this file and um, we want to be able to specify this so we can first um, use the file but if parts of the rendering stack become obsolete we want to be able to explicitly say what they can be migrated to or how they can be replaced. Um, 
specifying environments explicitly in a network like this also enables us to reuse information. So for example, I might have a, a second content file here, file two, that I'll requires the software library, so I don't have to rewind the software library and all its dependencies inside file two. I can simply link to it and reuse it. So different objects can reuse, and I can also distribute and reuse information from different repositories or registries. So for example, assume that the software application and software library are local, so they're stored and preserved and described in my repository, but the operating system and the hardware architecture already are uh, described and uh, preserved in outside registries and reused and shared with other people. So we want this sort of um, reusable and distributed and shared um, structure. So how, how do we move from version 2 to version 3? Uh, in version 2, environments are um, not, not entities. They are tucked away inside objects, and each object has uh, semantic units in which they, it, the object can describe what environment dependencies it has. And it is a bit limited in ex, its expressibility uh, and, and the complexity of environments that can be uh, described. And it also um, sort of suggests that um, the information gets repeated over again. And so what we realized is we, it would be much better off if we pull environments out and make them an entity. And when we investigated environments, we found that they actually have the same needs as objects. So the solution that we found is that we um, reuse the existing object entity in order to describe environments. And I'll show you what that means in practice. So um, reusing this existing object means we can describe environments on, on the levels of intellectual entity and representation and file. Um, and we can also reuse all the nice relationships that we already have. So in this example, I have a, a content file or a, a representation and its intellectual entity. And I say the content file represents the intellectual entity. Um, and it also requires a hardware operating system and software. So the description for the hardware operating system and software are done as intellectual entity objects. So I, I, I reuse this existing thing. And um, I'll show you in a second how I can describe them. And then I can also say I'm reusing not only intellectual entities, but for example, representations of files. So I might say I, the operating system, I have uh, a copy of it as an ISO image, which is a file. And the ISO image represents this intellectual entity. So I can reuse the same a uh, layered structure that I have for content objects and say, well, I can use intellectual entities to describe the environment. I can have representations for it. I can have files for it. I could even, if I wanted to have bit streams that describe an, an computing environment, if it is a software environment, for example. Um, the advantage also now is that we can much, much richer descriptions uh, and relationships for the environment. So in uh, version 2, the only thing we could say is an object has a certain environment as its computational context. So we could link from an object to an environment. That was the only thing. Now we can, for example, say an environment is associated with a content object, a document, as a manual that describes it, for example. We can link environments with each other, so they can be included in each other, have dependencies, derivations, generalizations, and so on. Um, I can also link uh, from an environment intellectual entity to the object. As I showed in, in the example, I could say this environment is the description of my operating system, and the student object is uh, the, the op the representation of it is the actual ISA image or the, the executable or the source code. So I can have that link. I can link an environment to rights that apply to it and to events that uh, have been performed on it. And finally, now I can 
I told you how in agents we can specify software agents just by name and version. Now we can actually have a link from an agent directly to the environment with a complete description of the environment. So we have a really good provenance information about the tools used in the agents that were applied to the digital object. So there's a variety of types of relationships for a rich description. So it's not just derivation and structural, but it could be reference to documents, replacements, it could be logical if one environment is a more generalized version of another and so on. And uh, then <clears throat> if an environment is, if an object is the special type of environment, then on an intellectual entity level we can have some descriptive metadata that's specific for environment. So this is the only case where we're actually saying, yes, we've adopted intellectual entities, we don't do descriptive metadata, but for environments we do some special descriptive metadata. And in an example here, I have created a, a description for um, XP Professional Service Pack 3 operating system. I have created an object identifier and say it is an intellectual entity, that means it's descriptive. And now I want to define the environment function. I say on level one, on the highest level, it can be specified as software. And on the next level, it can be specified as an operating system. Uh, in addition, I can give environment designation information, so I can give names, versions, origins, notes, and so on. So in this example, I might say it's a Windows XP Professional Service Pack 3 with a certain maintenance deadline. Then I can add links to external registries so that I can reuse um, the descriptions that have done by others. So I can say, uh, instead of giving a full-blown description of this environment in my, in my repository, I simply refer to a the pronom registry with the PUID that is used in, in pronom. Um, I'll skip this. And then I can also say, what the purpose of the environment is. So if, like these two top boxes on the top, they are intellectual entities describing two different software applications. One is Blue Griffin and one is Firefox. And I have a content object in HTML that has a requirement dependencies to both of them. And now I can distinguish wh why that is. So for example, I need the blue griffin because that's what I used to make my HTML files and I can use the Firefox to render my XML files and as a, an additional characteristics I can say it is known to work or I could, I could say it is recommended to use, things like that. So this was an overview over the new use and extended uh, use of modeling computing environments. And then finally, we have adopted physical objects into the scope of premise three. So in premise two, premise only could uh, reference or describe or use um, digital objects. And in order to be able to link to things that are outside the repository, we have taken physical objects into the scope of the data dictionary. So that means that we can re reference content objects, such as manuscripts or printed documents, for example, but we can also reference environment objects such as physical hardware devices. And we can describe them either we can represent either digital or physical ones as representations and uh, instantiate them. At, um, either one can instantiate an intellectual entity. So then digital and non-digital objects can be captured uniformly. They can be related to each other. And um, we can supply storage information for either one of them. So in this example, at the top box, I have an intellectual entity. Um, on which is a, a content file. And on the bottom, I have a TIFF image file, um, which represents this. And the TIFF image was um, 
digitized from a physical item. So now within premise I could identify the physical item and specify the relationship that has created this derivation and the event and the agent that have done that. So uh, I have a more integrated view on the world. Um, so this was a presentation of the main changes that are coming up in version 3. Um, we've also updated the conformance statement and that will be released even before version 3 comes out because it's independent and um, I, I included the URL for where you can find that within the next few days in the slides. And this was everything I meant to cover at, in this presentation so it's back to you now. Stefan or Stuart? Uh, yes, I'm, yes, I'm here. Thank you. Um, we are ready for questions. If you have questions of Angela, a uh, very, very thorough presentation, Angela, and very interesting. Um, let's see, I've got a first question. Do we need to convert or update premise records created based on version 2 to match the new enhancements in version 3? So I would say this is, a, this is this is a question. Every standard you use will be um, versioned at some point and updated, and um, there is no need for anybody to update it if they don't want to make use of the new features. If somebody is just setting out, then they can use the newest version, uh, or if somebody has been desperate because of features that are offered in version 3 but weren't available in version 2 and it would be worth their effort, then they could do it. But um, if your system runs and everything you need to do is fine, then you just need to record that you're using the version you're using, you don't have to update. Angela, let me ask a follow-on question with that one to your response. Um, what if someone does want to, uh, to migrate from version 2 to version 3. Um, how big a task is that? Um, I, I don't know at all, Stuart. I don't know what the implementation effort would be. Depend, that depends on the local implementation that you have, but I can tell you that we have taken great pains to uh, make the new features in a way that every existing feature in version 2 can be in a in a deterministic way to a feature in version 3. So there are no erratic changes. Um, version 3 is, I think, more powerful than version 2 and every feature that was supported in version 2 in maybe an awkward way is now supported in a more elegant way. But uh, the conversion should be straightforward. There's one teeny tiny exception uh, in version there is a variety of note and description fields and they would have been very awkward to support. They had, and I can't remember the detail now exactly, but uh, there was a minute distinction between a note and a description field and we have not maintained that. We have said if you want to upgrade or translate from version 2 to version 3, then map both of these description fields to the one new node field. But other than that, there's a, a clear mapping from version 2 to version 3. Another question. Is there a relationship between premise and the PROV ontology? Oh, that's a very good question and I'm embarrassed that I can't answer it very clearly. Um, we have for a long time said we should make an effort to align both of them and I think PROV has evolved to be much more like the premise model of it's basically about events, activities, agents and so on but we there was an early work where somebody compared the premise and the PROV features and um, I think that would be updated now because PROV has been developed further, but I can't give you a, a, a crisp answer to it. So at the moment, no, but we have been wanting to make a clear articulation of how they relate to each other and simply haven't had the time yet. I believe that would probably be very useful. Yeah. Here's another question. How is version 3 implemented differently in METS? There are actually two questions around METS that are very close, but 
how is version 3 implemented differently in METS? Um, we haven't done that bit yet. I wouldn't expect that it has a major impact on the use of the, the METS premise guidelines because the basic structures aren't changed. So we've always had the problem of um, that the METS structure with the, the administrative uh, section in METS is split up in rights, digital provenance, um, source and help me, technical metadata. And so these four categories have never perfectly fit onto the, the premise structure, the objects, entities, um, act, uh, the agents and rights. And so the guidelines that were written about what is best practice of mapping premise onto METS uh, still should hold. I don't think that th since we're reusing the existing object, um, there may be new nuances, but we haven't written that and, and uh, investigated that in depth yet. But the general guidelines should hold in the same way. So we might have to add new ideas about if we're describing environments, they would preferably go in a different med section. I don't know that yet. Thank you. Okay, here's another. Hi, Angela. Great presentation. Question. Do you know of any initiative to create a registry of environment information, service-oriented? Yeah. Um, I, uh, there was an EU project that was called um, KEEP, and they had a registry that uh, was called TOTEM. Uh, they have applied for continued funding. Uh, to keep doing the work, but they uh, didn't get funding in the last EU bid. And they have also worked with the um, National Library of Australia, and the National Library of Australia has done a lot of work to uh, collect envir technical environment information. Um, they've done a lot of preliminary work for their funding proposal to write up um, ideas about how that work could be done, and I think it's still a on the agenda that the work still should be done and they're trying to do it. Another question. What are the highly recommended XML schemas to be used for premise? Um, so the XML schema that the editorial committee supports is simply the one that's available on the Library of Congress website under premise. And so there's always a current version that is hand in hand with the data dictionary. Okay, one more. Any software programs available now that you would recommend to implement Premise? I'm sorry, could you say it again? I couldn't quite hear um, it. Are, whether there were any um, uh, software programs available now to implement that you would recommend to implement Premise? Um, that do you mean tools that should be used if you want to implement a premise profile from scratch? Right, my um, assumption would, yeah. Yeah, I, with that, I must say, so uh, the big implementers, the commercial ones and the open source implementers are actually working on implementing premise as fully as possible. Um, if you want to implement premise yourself, there is a part, a section on the premise um, website that lists premise tools. I'm afraid it's a little bit out of uh, date possibly. So it has, a, it has a plethora of tools that people have implemented over the years for implementing different aspects of premise and have a poke there. But when you find the tool that's most like what you want, you might want to follow up with the people who have written it and see if they can tell you what updates they are. Um, because it's very hard to keep these lists updated. So uh, another way to, to deal with this, if, if I'd started a new project, I would go to the premise implementers group list and ask really who has developed tools recently that they might want to share. And my assumption, Angela, would be that the, that um, uh, with Premise 3.0, there would be some updating 
of applications anyway. Absolutely, absolutely. So there is no, uh, there are no tools yet, obviously, because it hasn't come out yet. And uh, we've talked to some of the open source software developers. They say they're looking for sponsorship. So, for example, Archivematica needs a sponsor who will pay for the development of the tools to adapt to the new standard. Uh, it's just how it's done. And so they will be coming out over the next few months, I suppose. Okay, well, one more question, and I think we will, um, we will conclude. Uh, this actually is a question that has been in the queue, but it, and it aligns with the PROV premise question. And it's, uh, is there a working group, and I might add, or plans for a working group uh, on aligning PROV? And premise. Well, that would be fantastic. You know, as soon as we get this version 3 out and published, we will have some breathing space again because we've been working on nothing but this for months now. And uh, it has been on our to-do list and it would be wonderful if we could do that. Okay. Well, I think we are uh, getting close to the end of our time. Uh, thank you very, very much, Angela. Um, I am not uh, a, an expert in premise. I'm an expert in few things, in fact. But um, uh, this was very, very informative. And uh, the, the new modeling uh, that is being done, or the modeling revisions, uh, sound um, uh, like they hold great potential for, for a richer level of description with the premise. So thank you very much for a, a, a great webinar. And uh, I'm going to call on my friend Stefan. Stefan, are there any announcements that you want to make before we close? Um, the webinar, the recorded webinar and the presentation slides will be available within 48 hours of today's um, webinar presentation. So please be on the lookout. Uh, an email will be sent to all the attendees that are here today with the archived recording and the presentation slides. Great. Again, thank you very much, um, uh, Angela. And with that, I think we will conclude. Have a good thank day, you. everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.